Well, a uh, very good evening. It's time to start our first webinar of 2023. And I would wish you all and your families a very safe, healthy, and wonderful year ahead. We all have been together, you know, first Sunday of every month since last 23 months. It's incredible. And uh, the first webinar is a very important issue. That is the issue of VKH, uh, which we see. And we have the world-class experts with us today who will be uh, joining and who will be sharing their, their thoughts as usual. Please put your questions in Q&A box and our experts would be very happy interacting with you on one on one basis and typing the answers. And for CME credit hours, as usual, you will get the email. You have to fill in your inputs. And thank you for your inputs that help us to improvise. And uh, you will receive the CME credit hours as usual. With this, I will pass on the uh, to our moderator, Dr. Reema Bansal, to take it forward. Welcome once again. So thank you, a very happy new year to all of you. So we start with the first um, uh, talk uh, by Dr. Massimo Occhiorindi on epidemiology of VKH. Okay, so I'm sharing Good morning, everybody. Can you see my screen? Can you hear me? Yes, Massimo. Okay, so dear colleagues, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good evening, wherever you are. First of all, I would like to thank you, the organizing committee, for the kind invitation and the topic I'm dealing with is epidemiology of VKH. VKH is both a system inflammatory disease that affects uh, eyes, ears, brain, skin, and hair. It is an autoimmune inflammatory condition mediated by CD4 plus T cells the target melanocytes, and therefore it is intuitive that it has a predilection for pigmented races. HLA-DR4 has been found statistically associated with VKH in uh, many populations, including Hispanic USA, Brazilians, Saudi Arabians, Vietnamese, Chinese, Japanese, Korean, and Italians. And HLA-DRB1 or 405 carries a relative risk of developing VKH of 11 in Brazilians and 45 in South Koreans. Nevertheless, the role of genetic susceptibility in diagnosis and management of VKH is uncertain, if null. Before addressing the epidemiological features of this disease, I would like to remember the natural course. Uh, it comprises four phases. Uh, number one is the prodromal phase, with heat age, fever, orbital pain, staph nickness, vertigo, dysacusia, tinnitus, scalp, and skin hypersensitivity. After some days to one to two weeks, the acute uveitic phase appears, and it is characterized by the diffuse choroiditis with disc edema and hyperemia, subretinal fluid accumulation, and serial retinal detachment. Subsequent anterior segment involvement may occur after one to for after some days. The convalescence phase uh, comprises of skin and uveal depigmentation. <clears throat> Sojourner signs that is a perilimbal vitiligo is almost uh, seen exclusively in Asian patients, and uveal depigmentation, which hesitate in sunset glofundus, is uh, a worldwide characteristic. Vitiligo and alopecia are the skin uh, manifestation together with poliosis of the eyelashes, eyebrows, and gray hair. In the chronic recurrent phase, we can have anterior, posterior panuveitis, and usually during this phase, we, have, uh, we can encounter the onset of ocular complications. For the purpose of this study, of this presentation, I have divided the epidemiologic characteristic by uh, country and by continents. And uh, I would like to apologize if I cannot recall all the manuscripts written on this topic, but I have chosen the most numerous series uh, among them. Here are the data from Asia and Middle East. As you can see here, there is overall a female predominance with exception of China, when there is uh, the same distribution between sexes 
and uh, uh, Turkey, when there is, uh, it may be a male predominance. Um, the mean age at onset range from uh, 33 to 41, 45. And it's interesting to note that uh, in the Far East, uh, such as Japan, South Korea, China, Taiwan, Vietnam, the mean age at onset is around 40, while in the Middle East, Iran, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, and Turkey is around 33. And before addressing the epidemiology data from Europe, I would like to thank you, Sophia Andrudi from Thessaloniki, Greece, and uh, Nick Jones from Manchester, UK, who have provided their data, although they are not yet published. As you can see here, the mean age at onset uh, in Europe ranges from 32 to 39, <clears throat> and uh, we all have a female predominance. Nevertheless, it is very important to note that uh, um, in most of this series, the ethnicity of the patients was not reported. And therefore, I can guarantee you that the data from Italy, that is data coming from the center I'm working in, are all from Caucasian patients. While, for example, the data from uh, Nick Jones in Manchester, UK, out of 36 patients, 27 are from Asian origin. <laughs> This is the situation in uh, America, North and South America. As, as you can see, there is overall a female predominance and the mean age at onset is quite similar to that found in the Middle East. Same situation in Africa. We have two reports from Tunisia and Morocco and in Australia as well with a female predominance. What is the ratio between uh, VKH patients and uh, all the UVITIS patients seen in a referral center for UVITIS? In Asia, we have the PKH in Thailand and Saudi Arabia, 22% of the cases are BKH among all the UVITIS, and the lowest in Malaysia, 2%. While the most consistent data are coming from Japan, because this 8.1% of VKH among all the UVITIS are referred to 66 hospital and university throughout Japan. In Europe, we have uh, an incidence ranging from 0.4 in the Netherlands and 2.8 in Italy. In uh, uh, America, the peak, uh, on the peak incidence is in Chile, 70%, and in Africa, in Egypt, uh, 60%. What happens of VKH over time? This is a report from Hokkaido, northern part of Japan, and the authors uh, have studied two consecutive decades of patients with uveitis, as, as you can see here, there is a similar incidence of VKH during the year, and also there is the mean, the mean age at onset is quite similar. So I have a look at my data in Rome and also data from Manchester, UK. And as you can see in the left side of the slides, we have an increasing incidence of VKH during time, one while in the Manchester there was a peak incidence uh, around the 2000 and uh, after all, an almost equal distribution of patients. Another important thing to look at is the seizure variation of the onset of uh, VKH. And these are two, um, <clears throat> uh, two studies from uh, yes. Professor Ono. One is from uh, uh, 1985 on the left side on the slides, and he has found that there is a, um, an incidence, a peak incidence, a peak incidence of VKH in spring and autumn. And when he moved to the central Japan, Yokohama, he found the same finding. Uh, more recently, there was a paper from Puerto Rico which uh, uh, demonstrated that uh, the uh, peak onset of the disease was during fall. And therefore, I have asked my good friend, uh, Hanabel Okada from Kyorin University in, to in Tokyo, Japan, to look at her data and to, co to compare her data with mine. And as you can see here, the monthly variation of VKH as well, the seasonal variation is uh, almost the same in Italy and Japan. Uh, also, if we uh, combine all the data, there is a slight uh, more incidence in winter and fall, but without statistical significance. Another important thing to, to know is, uh, is there any different clinical expression of VKH according to ethnicity? And this is a paper coming from France where uh, the authors have divided their patients into those coming from Maghreb, that is no other part of Africa, such as uh, Morocco, Tunisia, and uh, Algeria, with all the other population. And as you can see here, most of them are coming from Southeast Asia or Japan. 
And in this case, uh, they have found no difference as far as concerned the main symptoms and the clinical findings, but there is uh, a lower age at diagnosis in Maghreb and uh, more female predominance. Another important thing to, uh, to address is the different clinical expression according to ethnicity, modalities of treatment, and outcome. And this is a paper from Carl Erbot and the other authors, including Hamed, uh, who have reported the experience of the treatment with uh, a tonset with steroids and immunosuppressive in some patients. And both in Switzerland and Saudi Arabia, they were able uh, not to have any patients uh, developing the chronic form of the disease and the sans glofundus. The same experience was uh, in India with 25% of patients of uh, patients developing sans glofundus, uh, 17 the chronic form of the disease, while in China no one developed the chronic form and but 25% the sans glofundus. In Japan, there are five series comprising 435 patients, and in this case, there were 60% of the patients developed in the sans glofunda 25 the chronic form. More recently, other two papers coming from Singapore and South Korea have addressed the same topic with a combined therapy within three months from the onset of the disease, and in both series, they found 50% of the patients developing the sans glofunda and the chronic form of the disease. If I can add just my personal experience in five Italian patients who, for different reasons, were not able to take immunosuppressive therapy and they were treated with intravenous steroids at onset and oral thereafter. In the meantime of treatment was 16 months and none of them developed relapses or chronic form of the disease in a follow-up without therapy of 74 months. Just to finish, I've looked at the different clinical expression according to the age at onset. We know that the BKH in children accounts for 1 to 50% of all the patients with BKH. And in 1998, Professor Tabara from Saudi Arabia have reported that the course of the disease in children was worse than that in adults with a more incidence of complications. And these are the latest publication on this topic coming from Iran, to from India, USA, Morocco, Brazil, and Saudi Arabia. And all of them have reported a little worse prognosis, visual final visual prognosis in children, although all of them have been treated with systemic steroids, some with periocular steroids as well, and the most of them with the, the, the immunosuppressive therapy. The feeling of all the authors is that uh, the worst prognosis in children may be related to a, a delayed referral to, uh, to centers uh, able to use from the very initial part of the disease, uh, the immunosuppressors. And I would like to thank you very much for your attention. Uh, also, I would like to remember Manfred for many, many things, including the invention of these webinars. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Nasimo. That was an excellent uh, coverage of the epidemiology of BKH. So with this, we now move on to the second uh, topic of today's webinar, uh, pathogenetic mechanisms in BKH. And Dr. Pizing Yang would be talking on this. Over to you, Dr. Yang. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor to present our study here. I will talk about pathogenetic study on VKH syndrome. As you know, VKH syndrome is a systemic autoimmune disease manifesting as bilateral gradulomatous pyoviitis, often associated with auditory, vestibular, and central nervous system involvement. It frequently occurs in Chinese, Japanese, Hispanic, Greeks, and uh, Native American. Based on our previous study, it's account for 30.5% to 15.9% of total uveitis patients in China. The mechanism of VKH syndrome are not completely understood. It has been presumably caused by 
an immune response against melanin associated antigen, retinal S antigen, and the interphotoreceptor retinoid binding protein. It has been also shown genetic, genetic factors are involved in its development. We have focused on the mechanism involved in this disease for more than 30 years. Our study mainly focused on immunological mechanism and the genetic background in this disease. In immunological study, we for the first time show that the Th17 cell play an important role in this, this disease. We found IO23P19M RNA expression was significantly increased by PBMC. The level of IO23 in the serum and the supernatant of culture PBMC was also increased in active VKH patient. IO17 level in the serum and the supernatant of a GD4 positive T cell was elevated in active VKH patient. IO23 could promote the IO17 production by PBMC. Then we found RPE could be the target of a TH17 cell. We found that ARP19 cell express IO17 receptor. IO17A enhances the production of some cytokine and chemokine. IO17A and IO17F could decrease the transepithelial electrical resistance of ARP19 monolayer and increase the diffuse rate of Fifth dextrin, IO17A and IO17F could disturb the one and occluding expression. Our further study to review a large regulatory network for uh, TH17 cell, including positive molecule and the pathway and the negative molecule for 17. T cell for TH17 cell. The positive molecule and the pathway include OPN, IO21, IO7, large pathway, toll like receptor pathway. The negative molecule for TH17 cell include IO37, IO27, HR, MIR155, vitamin D3, microbe. One for uh, 6A and the liver X receptor. Here I will I give some example to show the possible role of the molecule in VKH syndrome. The first example uh, to show the possible role of IO21 in this disease. We found the increased serum IO21 level in active VKH patient. We also found a higher expression of IO21 MRA expression by PBMC. IO21 could promote IO17 production by CD4 positive T cell. The second example uh, uh, to study the role of OPN in VKH syndrome. We found that OPN serum level was increased in active VKH patient. OPN could induce proliferation of PBMG and CD4 positive T cell. OPN could promote the production of interferon gamma and IO17. The third example are to uh, uh, to, the study, uh, to study the role of IO7 in VKH syndrome. We found the IO7 level was the increase in active VKH patient. IO7 promotes the proliferation of PBMC and CD4 positive T cell. 
IO-7 could enhance the production of IO-17 IO and the interferon gamma by PBMC and the CD4 positive T cell. The first example uh, are, to the, are to study the role of node one and node two in weak H syndrome. We found the higher expression of node one and node two in active weak H patient. Activation of node one and node two may increase the production of IO6 interferon alpha and IO1 beta by PBMC and dendritic cell and induce the expression of CD40, CD80, CD83, CD86, and HRA DR antigen by dendritic cell. Activation of node one and node two could induce the differentiation and the proliferation of CD4 positive T cell. The fifth example uh, was to study the role of IO-27 in VKH syndrome. We found a decreased IO-27 uh, P28 MR expression uh, by PBMC in active VKH patient. We also found a decreased serum IO-27 level in this DG. IO-27 could inhibit TH17 cell differentiation. IO-27 treated dendritic cell could significantly inhibit TH17 differentiation, TH17 cell differentiation. Corticosteroid combined with the cyclosporin could resolve the intraocular inflammation in association with IO-27 upper regulation and uh, IO-17 down regulation. The sixth example was to study the role of IO-37 in VKH syndrome. We found the decrease IO-37 IO and the IO-27 expression associated with the increase IO-1 beta, IO-6, and the TN4 alpha. IO-37 could significantly inhibit the expression of IO-1 beta, IO-6, and the TN4 alpha, but induce IO-27 IO expression. Corticosteroid plus uh, cyclosporin inhibit the intraocular inflammation and enhance IO-37 production. The seventh example was to study the role of IO-35 in VKH syndrome. We found that a decreased serum level of IO-35 uh, in active VKH patient. The MRI expression of two subunits was also decreased. IO-35 could inhibit IO-17 and the interferon gamma production and the induce IO-10 production. The eighth example was to study the role of DAB2 in VKH syndrome. We found MRI and protein expression level of DAB2 in the adrenic cell were, were decreased in active VKH patient. DAB2 overexpression could downregulate CD86 expression and on the adrenic cell and the production of IO6 and the TNF alpha. DAB2 overexpression inhibit TH1 and the TH17 cell differentiation and the production of IO17 and the interferon gamma. The second area uh, of our study was to investigate the genetic background and the VKH syndrome. It has been shown certain HRA antigen associated with this disease. We have done GWAS analysis 
to investigate the genetic background in the development of VKH syndrome. We found two novel non-HRA genes were associated with VKH syndrome. We also found IO-23 was also associated with the VKH syndrome in Singapore population. We also found 13 genes were uh, associated with this disease. We also investigated the copy number of variation of a number of, a, a number of genes associated with the VKH syndrome. We found the CMV of a micro I 20A, micro I 146A, C3, C4, IO 15F, IO 20A, and F were associated with the VKH syndrome. So summary, uh, we have established the largest UVIT sample bank, including more than 40,000 sample from UVIT patient, and the database from more than 30,000 patients with various UVIT entities. Using this uh, sample bank, we have done a number of studies we show that TH17 cell play an important role in the development of VKH syndrome. We then identify that RPE is a target of TH17 cell. Our further study reveal a regulatory network for TH17 cell. Finally, we show a number of, a number of genes associated with the development of this DD. Based on our study and others, we propose a theory of a TH17 cell overreaction in the development of VKH syndrome. This slide shows the frame of a TH17 cell overreaction theory in VKH DD. In the individual with a certain genetic background, Disturb regulatory network lead to overreaction of TH17 cell and the intern result in release of some chemical and the cytokine. And the disturbance of RP barrier function and eventually leading to the development, recurrence, and the chronicity of this disease. Finally, I would like to thank my colleague and my student for their great contribution in the study of uh, VKH syndrome and other UVITs. I would like also to thank my good friend, Isaac Kilstra, for his great assistance in our study. We have collaborated with each other for more than 20 years. We have been, we have published more than 200 papers in the Western Journal. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Yang. So that was an extensive work by your team over several years. And thank you for showing us all the possible mechanisms in VKH, inflammatory, genetic, and so on. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. So we now uh, move on to the next um, topic of this webinar by Dr. Russell Reed, who will be talking on the clinical spectrum and classification of VKH. All right, well, thank you. Uh, can you see my screen and hear me all right? Yeah. Excellent. All right. Well, thanks again for the invitation uh, to participate in this, this symposium. Uh, two great talks already that have set the stage for what I'm going to talk about, which, as you can see, is the clinical spectrum and then classification of VKH. So as you've heard, VKH is a chronic bilateral granulomatous panuveitis autoimmune in nature that goes through various stages, at least in our classic understanding. So the prodromal stage, which isn't always present or at least always uh, elicited on history, involves CNS and auditory symptoms 
such as a headache, meningismus, tinnitus, um, and other things. And frequently, patients will end up admitted into the hospital with what's thought to be an aseptic meningitis. They come in with meningismus-like uh, symptoms, are admitted, they have a spinal tap, which is uh, sterile. And then over the course of a few days to weeks, they'll develop ocular complaints. And then ophthalmology is brought into the picture and they're found to be in the acute uveitic phase, which we'll talk about in a little more detail in just a moment. And then either with or without treatment, they go on to the convalescent phase, which is where the integumentary manifestations occur, the poliosis, alopecia, um, and, um, and vitiligo can occur. And then in variable um, prevalences, patients will go into the recurrent phase where they have recurrent episodes of uh, primarily anterior uveitis without the posterior manifestations. So let's talk a little bit more specifically about those phases. So um, again, acutely, the neurologic phase is usually first, but the ocular phase is consisting primarily of a diffuse choroiditis. So the choroid, the posterior uvea, is the initial um, location in the eye that's involved. And that'll manifest as either diffuse choroidal thickening on imaging, as well as exudative retinal detachments and a papillitis. They may or may not have intraocular cells at that time. In fact, it's quite striking that sometimes the, the media of a patient with acute VKH is, is crystal clear. If you do a fluorescein angiogram, which I really think you should in a patient you suspect a VKH, early in phase, you'll see these small punctate hyperfluorescent spots that tend to then coalesce and you have subretinal pooling in the space that's created in these serous detachments. And then you'll also have disc hyperfluorescence. I personally think that a B-scan ultrasonography is critical in the workup of a patient with VKH because, again, the primary site of the acute phase of the disease, which I guess I should say is also commonly referred to as Harada's disease, but I prefer to refer to it as acute or early VKH. But again, the primary site of inflammation is the choroid. You'll have diffuse choroidal thickening. Now, yes, you can demonstrate that on OCT through enhanced depth imaging, but what OCT enhanced depth imaging doesn't yet give us to my satisfaction is a view all the way through a thickened uh, choroid to the sclera. So one of the key differentials in your workup of EKH patient is whether this represents posterior scleritis, because posterior scleritis can also present with headache. Now, you're not going to have the other neurologic symptoms such as meningismus, et cetera, but eye pain in the form of, or is it caused by posterior scleritis could present as headache. You can have choroidal thickening because of concurrent inf or adjacent inflammation and then serous detachments. Now, if you do an ultrasound, then the choroidal thickening is most prominent peripapillary. Again, you can see serous detachments. Um, you can have some mild scleral thickening, but it should be mild, not marked as you would see in posterior scleritis. And usually that's only adjacent to where the choroidal thickening is. So again, you need to see no evidence of posterior scleritis. You may or may not see vitreous opacities. <clears throat> now, again, as technology advances, as it always does, our imaging modalities have improved. And so OCT, especially with enhanced depth imaging, is critical now as well because in a, as an adjunct to the B-scan. Again, as I mentioned, you can't really rule out a posterior scleritis with enhanced depth imaging, but you certainly can see these basilary layer detachments, which is a more recent recognition of a finding in BKH, which are very characteristic of that. And you can also see a response to treatment of this marked choroidal thickening so that by a patient in this uh, paper that was published, you can actually start to see the posterior choroidal border here. Pleocytosis is a, a common finding. Um, this is done most commonly outside the U.S. It's my experience, obviously, is in the U.S. alone, but when it is done, it's mostly lymphocytes. It occurs in 80% of patients within a week of onset of symptoms, 97% within three weeks. And again, this is why patients may be diagnosed as having an aseptic meningitis uh, early on in the phase of this before the ocular symptoms. This typically resolves within about eight weeks and usually does not recur even with recurrent disease, although it can. And then the, the fascinating thing to me about VKH is the different phases of the disease. So when it becomes chronic, the most characteristic ocular finding is a sunset glow fundus, as you can see in the top. And you really have to see this live in person to know what it means. I mean, obviously the ocular fundus is fairly orange, 
uh, in appearance to start with, but there's a different nature to the orange um, coloration that's present that looks very characteristic. They also will develop these small numular chorioretinal lesions, primarily inferiorly, and then again, a chronic iridocyclitis. And it's in this late phase that patients will develop, again, the integumentary manifestations, vitiligo, poliosis, and, and alopecia. So you've already heard an uh, excellent talk from Massimo on the ethnicity and epidemiology. Um, and when I was a fellow with Dar uh, Narsing Rao, we looked at our data and found that, uh, as was a question in the, um, the chat earlier and also in Massimo's talk, that it's much more common in people that originated in, in Asia and migrated around the world, including Hispanics in the U.S., um, and I'm going to skip through some of this in the interest of time. Now, VKH prognosis is quite variable. Visual loss is not at all uncommon. That usually comes about from the complications from the disease, such as cataract that can occur in up to almost 40% of eyes, glaucoma in almost half of eyes, coronal neovascularization in up to 12%, and then even subretinal fibrosis in a, a significant proportion. And so this can result in fairly quite variable vi uh, final visual acuities, but as you can see from this table, the worst visual acuities tend to occur in those patients that not surprisingly have the most complications. So early recognition and treatment are critical so that you reduce both the duration of disease, because patients with a longer duration are more likely to have complications than those with a shorter duration, and also reduce the number of recurrences. So Again, early recognition is important. Now, the differential of VKH can be quite wide, and as you can see here, includes a number of entities. Sympathetic is what I would call the kissing cousin of VKH. It's almost, it appears to be the same disease, at least clinically, but with a, a known trigger, that trigger being penetration of one eye, priming of the immune system, and then a subsequent targeting of both eyes. So a history of trauma or previous penetrating surgery, especially multiple vitreoretinal surgeries, is key to ruling out sympathetic as opposed to VKH. But our usual suspects of sarcoid, tuberculosis, syphilis have to be ruled out as well. And then other entities like lupus choroidopathy could present with serous detachments, even uveal effusion syndrome, especially as I mentioned, because some of these patients will have no intraocular inflammation at the very beginning of their disease, at least no cell in the vitreous or aqueous. Uh, clearly, they have inflammation, but it may be within the tissue. Posterior scleritis, I already discussed, lymphoma. Again, in the aged population we're talking about is very low on the list, but we never really should forget that. So there is no single diagnostic test for VKH. All the amazing work done by Dr. Yang may certainly result in tests at some point as we begin to understand the underlying pathophysiology better. But right now, we have no diagnostic test. The genetic testing is an association test. It's similar to A29 or B27. Those are not diagnostic tests. They're supportive, but they don't make the diagnosis. So the diagnosis of VKH is clinical. You have to look at the patient list the different features, rule out other causes. So to help with that, a variety of diagnostic criteria have been developed to aid in this. And there's a number of sets that have been published going as far back as 1978 when both uh, Segura and the American UBI Society published criteria. And then the revised diagnostic criteria that were published out of the International Workshop in 2001, and then a subsequent follow-on study looking at trying to narrow those down in 2010, uh, the Chinese diagnostic criteria published in 2018, and most recently, the SUN classification criteria in 2021. And in the last five minutes here, I'm going to go through these sort of briefly. There's, there's a lot of similarities. It's more a matter of how you slice and dice the different clinical features. So the AUS criteria came about, really, I was surprised when I looked at this, only from 20 patients. And this was uh, developed at a uveitis society meeting in Kansas City back in 1978. And the key feature was, as I mentioned, to rule out sympathetic, no history of trauma or surgery. And then you had to have one finding from at least three of these four groups. But if you look at this, there's a problem with this criteria in that two of the criteria are from the chronic phase of the disease, the bilateral chronic iridocyclitis and the cutaneous signs, and two are from the acute phase of the disease. Well, if you have acute disease, you can't, by definition, have three of these groups unless, for some reason, they have early onset of some of the late phase. So we actually looked at that, took a patient of populations from Doheny, and retrospectively applied the AUS criteria and found that the patients that we were convinced had BKH had a very low, uh, or the AUS criteria had a very low predictive rate of that being BKH. Um, 
the things that helped us in making the diagnosis of EKH that weren't a part of the AUS criteria were the use of fluorescein angiography and ultrasonography in one or both, and you can see almost 90% of our patients. And then in the chronic phase of the disease, 47% um, had hypopigmented fundus lesions, those numular lesions, not the sunset glow fundus, and uh, over half had some form of pigment migration. So many of the people on this, uh, this webinar were involved in this international a collaboration looking at modifying and revising diagnostic criteria. And this was published in May of 2001. And again, a key feature is there has to be no history of penetrating ocular trauma or surgery. You have to rule out other ocular entities and it has to be bilater bilateral. Yes, there can be unilateral BKH, although it's probably more likely just asymmetric, but to meet the criteria diagnosis for all of these criteria we're gonna talk about, you need to have bilateral involvement. And then we divided the manifestations into early and late. So early, as I mentioned, you need a diffuse choroiditis. And the way we said you should uh, determine that is with focal areas of subretinal fluid or bullous detachments or evidence of choroidal thickening on ultrasonography and fluorescein angiography. And then either you could or couldn't have these other features. Now, because this was in 2001, while yes, OCT was very common at that time or becoming more common at that time, we certainly did not have enhanced depth imaging. And that's why that wasn't included at that time. And then the late features, um, history of suggestive early, early disease, plus depigmentation, either as a sunset glow or Segura sign, which is depigmentation at the limbus, usually superiorly, and then other features as uh, described. And then patients needed to have systemic features as well. And then if you combine all those together, we came up with this concept of complete, incomplete, and probable disease. And really, I think there's been a misunderstanding of the intent of this categorization over time. Because just because you say someone has probable or incomplete, it doesn't mean it's not BKH. It just means they don't have all the features. And the purpose of that was to try to stratify patients who had BKH for additional study. Are there certain ethnic groups or ages or ethnicities, whatever, that might be more likely to have incomplete versus complete disease. But regardless of that, and this is just the criteria laid out as it was in the paper, which is way too small to read here, this we felt was useful due to its granularity for clinical trials, but fairly complicated for clinical use. So a subsequent study by the same group um, was trying to come up with more practical criteria, which would probably be useful for this audience for making the diagnosis in the clinic. And so this was a large multinational study with a lot of patients. You can see almost 1,200 around the world, made up of 180 VKH patients. And the basic idea is in acute VKH, the key finding is bullous retinal detachments and choroidal thickening. You can see the positive predictive values and negative predictive values if you don't have those for making the diagnosis of acute VKH. In chronic VKH, the key features are sunset glow fundus, and depending on the patient um, and where you are in the world, the Segura sign, as well as vitiligo. So I'm going to move forward a little bit. The Chinese developed another set of criteria, which are similar but to the uh, original revised criteria, but add in use of OCT. Um, the other features are, are, again, fairly similar, and they found, looking at receiver operator curves, uh, no loss in sensitivity, but greater specificity, making these potentially more useful. And then most recently, the Sun Working Group has come up with classification criteria, which, again, are very similar, and this was, again, a very large number of patients uh, both the early stage and late stage, and they use machine learning um, to examine clinical features of a number of cases presented by clinicians is, who said these had VKH. And again, the criteria are very, very similar to the ones that we've already seen. Um, and then the Chinese group, again, compared all three sets of criteria, found that the Chinese criteria, again, had the highest sensitivity and specificity, the revised criteria next, and the sun criteria for this, and at least in their population of patients. So last slide, the take-home points are that VKH is a disease which I think has fascinatingly different presentations early and late, which you must keep in mind where you're looking at the patient. In the absence of definitive diagnostic testing, these, these um, criteria are helpful. Multiple sets are available, but the key take-home point is the essential features of the acute disease are evidence of a diffuse choroiditis, and for chronic disease of depigmentation and chronic uveitis in the absence of other explanations for the condition. And so with that, I'll thank you very much for your attention and uh, look forward to listening to everyone else's talks.
Thank you, Dr. Reed, for the elaborate uh, uh, topic of uh, clinical spectrum of BKH. So with this, we now move on to the next uh, topic, Imaging in BKH by Dr. Ahmed uh, Al uh, Abu al -Israr. So he'll be talking thank on you. Imaging in BKH. Thank you very much. I would like to thank the organizers for the kind invitation. I'm going to discuss mostly imaging and the acute uveitic phase of Wachtukanagi Harada disease. As it has been mentioned, uveitis associated with VKH disease is bilateral granulomatous band uveitis with secondary exertive retinal detachment. Patients with the disease show different clinical manifestations depending on the duration of the disease before presentation. And this is extremely important because patients with early presentation they present with granulomatous choroiditis with second exertive retinal detachment and optic disc hyperemia with or without swelling, but with quiet anterior segment. So at this stage, the anterior segment is completely quiet, and this is sometimes result in some confusion. Then if the disease is not treated, the anterior segment will become inflamed, and this we call this presentation delayed presentation of initial onset acute uveitis associated with VKH disease. Then if the patient uh, not well controlled, the disease will proceed to chronic recurrent granulomatous anterior segment inflammation with sunset glofundus. And this is a very bad situation because these patients become more refractory to treatment and they re require more prolonged courses of immunosuppressive therapy. It is now well established that Sunset glofundus is due to progressive subclinical choroidal inflammation due to inadequate immunosuppressive therapy in the early phases of the acute uveitic uh, uh, phases. Recently, we, we looked at um, uh, 112 patients with initial onset acute VKH, and uh, these patients were divided into two groups. The group that presented without anterior segment inflammation, and that we, this were early presentation, and the group that presented with delayed presentation with anterior segment inflammation. And all these patients were managed according to our protocol using combination of systemic corticosteroids combined with immunomedulatory agent, mostly mycophenolate mofetil, as an initial treatment. At presentation. We showed in a previous study that using mycophenolate mofetil in initial onset acute VKH disease can prevent chronic recurrent evolution and prevent sunset glofundus. Not only this, but also prevented the development of systemic complications such as vitiligo, bilioses, and alopecia. If you, uh, if you look at this table, those patients who presented early None of them developed um, uh, sunset glofundus. On the other hand, about 50-60% um, uh, uh, of the delayed presentation developed sunset glofundus. And the chronic recurrent evolution, none of those patients who presented early developed, uh, progressed into chronic recurrent evolution. On the other hand, about 30% of the late presentation progressed into chronic recurrent evolution. And this is an example of, uh, of such patients. This is early presentation. With early presentation, as you can see here, the executive retinal detachment is confined to the psoriasis. And this patient ended with without sunset glofundus. And those patients who presented late, 60% of them had bolus executive retinal detachment spreading to the periphery. And about 60% of these patients ended with sunset glofundus and 30% progressed into chronic recurrent evolution. This is an example, also an example of, of a patient with very early initial presentation without anterior segment inflammation and ending without sunset glofundus. And in these patients, we can discontinue immunosuppressive therapy and they remain quiet. So that means that we have long-term remission. In fact, by comparing the two groups using Kaplan-Meier survival curve, we showed that these patients 
um, with early presentation, you can stop the treatment at a significantly shorter time. So that means that we, we identified what we call it therapeutic window of opportunity for highly successful treatment in those patients with early presentation without anterior segment inflammation. But the, the, the major challenge here is that we need to diagnose these patients early. Unfortunately, at presentation, many of these patients were not diagnosed by the ophthalmologist because many of them were diagnosed, misdiagnosed as central cell scroidopathy. And as Russell mentioned, some of them also were referred to neurology. In two studies, 22% of the patients with VKH were initially misdiagnosed as central cell scroidopathy. In another study, 14% were misdiagnosed as central cell scroidopathy. So with imaging, we should be able to make the distinction between early VKH and central cell scroidopathy. And OCT was shown to be very useful in making this differentiation between early VKH and central cell scroidopathy. So the, these findings are suggestive of VKH, RBE endulations, subretinal septa or membranes that were thought to represent a portion of the outer photoreceptor segment layer that is separated from the inner segment by soil space, subretinal hyperreflective dots, which represents clumps of um, inflammatory debris, intraretinal edema and outer retinal layers, fluctuations of the internal limiting membrane, second decroid, of course. It has been shown also that RBE bulge, this is seen mostly in central cell scroidopathy and pigment epithelium detachment is more common in cell scroidopathy. Two studies looked at uh, the benefits of um, um, uh, OCT angiography. And they showed that choriocapillaries in patients with VKH, they have what's called blood flow void. However, there are a lot of artifacts that will help, that will make interpretation of OCT and geography uh, of the choroid, of the choriocapillaries very difficult. So these are examples of RBE and deolations that you can see here. And this is a, a RBE and deolations also, um, example of uh, subretinal membranes or septa. It's another example of subretinal membrane or septa. Now, interesting green angiography has been shown also to be very useful in, in uh, diagnosis of acute uh, uh, VKH. In this study that published some years ago, we looked at 36 patients, 72 eyes. In fact, the Dr. Vishal Gopta was involved in this study. And the easiest and most common uh, sign on ICG is the presence of hypofluorescent dark dots that was present in 100% uh, 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 of the patients. And this is an example of an uh, uh, early presentation, initial onset acute VKH disease. And uh, you can see the oxidative retinal detachment, of course, optic nerve head hyperemia. I am always telling my residents that without optic nerve head inflammation, you cannot diagnose VKH. And the other eyes, the oxidative detachment is more. But here, this is early presentation because the oxidative detachment is confined to the uh, retina. And on fluorescein angiography, please note the optic nerve head inflammation, multiple pinpoint leaks, and pooling of dye in the late phases of fluorescein uh, angiography. But also on ICG, the ICG shows that the, the, there are so many hypofluorescent spots. These hypofluorescent spots are corresponding to granulomas. And as we presented um, in, uh, in this manuscript, um, the areas of oxidative are, um, uh, retina detachment will appear as diffuse hypofluorescence, as you can see here. And uh, the patient, this is early presentation patient, after um, 12 months of um, systemic corticosteroid plus mycophenolate mofetil as a primary treatment, um, patient ended without some signal and this is another patient. This patient, in fact, was um, referred with the possible diagnosis of central cell scroidopathy because of the limited oxidative retinal detachment in both eyes. But the ICG was very important to, to confirm the diagnosis of um, VKH 
because you can see many hypofluorescent spots corresponding to the granulomas. And there's this another example of early presentation with executive detachment confined to the macula. And fluorescent geography typically will show pinpoint leaks, as you can see here, and late pooling of by um, uh, delineating the area of executive retinal detachment. And again, the ICG is showing uh, hypofluorescent spots corresponding to the granulomas and diffuse hypofluorescence corresponding to executive retinal detachment. And we described in this paper for the first time the presence of um, multiple hyperfluorescent spots. And this is uh, uh, another example. Now, some people, they talk about unilateral VKH, which is not correct. There is nothing called unilateral VKH. VKH is always bilateral, uh, granulomatous inflammation of the croid. And uh, we had in our series of patients 10 patients who presented with unilateral executive retinal detachment. This does not mean that, that the patient has unilateral leakage, because if you do ICG in the same eye, you see the hypofluorescent spots. Of course, with um, OCT, you can demonstrate choroidal secondary. Now, we used also in, in patients with VKH macroperimetry to assess the macular function, because we know that Corrected visual acuity is a very good way to assess macular function. So this is a patient with init early initial onset VKH, and the patient ended without sun signal fundus. And those macroperimetry look, this is a color map. Red, red means uh, zero decibel, green means best uh, macular sensitivity. And so this patient ended with 11.9 and 11.7 decibels. Another patient with early presentation and ended with 10 and 10 decibels in, uh, in the right and left eye. But look at this patient, patient who ended with sun signal fundus, despite the fact that the vision was 20, 30 on both eyes. But the patient ended with five decibel in the right eye and 1.9 decibel in the left eye. Please keep in mind that in the normal population, the same age group, the, 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 the sensitivity is about 19.6 decibels. And this is another patient with sunset glofundus 20, 30, 20, 20 vision. But despite this, the sensitivity was extremely low. So the, the macroperimetry told us um, uh, that uh, the Snellen visual acuity will underestimate the, uh, the loss of visual function in patients with sunset glofundus. Then in another study, we looked at, we did longitudinal analysis of macular sensitivity in patients with um, um, uh, initial onset acute VKH. So we looked at a different time uh, points to macular sensitivity after starting immunosuppressive therapy. And these patients were followed for about for one year. And you can see that the logmar best corrected visual acuity um, reached its maximum at uh, month three and then remained the same. So the vision improved um, uh, um, reached its maximum at three months, and there is no further improvement. And if you look here, and the mean retinal sensitivity, it continued to improve up to 12 months, meaning that the improvement of mean retinal, of retinal sensitivity was much slower than best corrected visual acuity. And fixation stability also reached its maximum level at three months, and then remained uh, stable. We also notice that the magnitude of the improvement in best corrective visual acuity was much more than uh, uh, the magnitude of improvement in mean sensitivity. So by the end of the, like this is an example of, uh, of a patient presented with zero discipline in both eyes, and after immunosuppressive treatment, the uh, sensitivity, of course, increased, but never reached um, uh, it's a normal level. This is another example of presentation and that ended with a reasonable amount, reasonable sensitivity. So, but we noticed that by 12 months follow-up, the mean retinal sensitivity was still only 12. And as I said, the normal populations, they have 19.6, which means that, that these patients, they have permanent damage of the photoreceptors, possibly related to 
pathology of the choroid and retinal pigment uh, epithelium. Then uh, we, we, um, we, 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 we investigated the effect of immunosuppressive therapy on uh, choroidal blood flow. As you know, patients with volcan Nagarada disease, they have diffuse granulomatous choroiditis. And the, 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 the choroid is very edematous. And this inflammation and the edema will induce some sort of inflammation-related choroidal impairment. So we were interested to, to, to study using the recently available laser speckle fullography, which uh, uses the laser speckle phenomena to detect the speckle pattern produced by the interference of illuminating laser light um, uh, and scattered by the movements of the resources in the blood vessels. And the, the, we, uh, the machine used what's called MPR that serve as a quantitative index of blood uh, cell speed. So um, this is a typical example uh, uh, in, uh, of patients included in this study, early initial onset acute VKH. And And uh, this is um, uh, a patient with initial onset acute VKH. And um, uh, this is the color map of the laser speckle fullography at presentation. And um, the blue means low blood flow velocity. The red means high blood flow velocity. And you can see after immunosuppressive therapy, the color, the blue color is changing to green, meaning that immunosupp uh, immunosuppressive therapy was effective in improving the choroidal blood flow. And not only this, um, the, re the resistivity index, because the machine can tell us uh, about the resistivity index, the resistivity index of the choroidal circulation was, uh, improving, uh, 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 was improving with time. So in uh, we can conclude from the ocular blood flow data using laser speckle fullography that in the acute vitic phase, we have some sort of inflammation related um, impairment of choroidal blood flow. And proper immunosuppressive therapy is very useful uh, to improve the choroidal blood flow. In another study, we, we, we compared, as I said, central cells choroidopathy is frequently um, um, confused with early presentation of VKH. So we wanted to know what is the difference in choroidal blood flow between controls, central cells choroidopathy, and VKH disease. And we could, if we look at the choroidal MEPR, choroidal MEPR, which is an index of choroidal blood flow velocity, was significantly higher in central cells choroidopathy compared to control and also compared to VKH. And the VKH levels of choroidal blood flow velocity were significant lower than controls and central serous choroidopathy. And meaning that these two diseases uh, in which the choroid is involved are completely different. Central serous choroidopathy is um, uh, uh, associated with increased choroidal blood flow velocity. On the other hand, VKH is associated with decreased choroidal blood uh, flow velocity. This is an example. This is a patient with VKH, initial onset presentation, early presentation, OCT, policial angiography, and ICG. And you can see that the map is blue, meaning that the choroidal blood flow velocity is very low in both eyes. But this is compared to a patient with central cell choroidopathy. This is um, uh, um, uh, neurosensor retinal separation shown by OCT and the fluorescent angiography. But again, look at the color map. The color map is green, meaning that the choroidal blood flow velocity here is very high. As a part of uh, imaging, um, uh, we were looking at uh, biomarkers of inflammation um, in, uh, in the equus humor of patients with different uvitic entities, including um, uh, VKH, uh, Behsche disease, HLB27, sarcoidosis, and of course, controls. The idea 
is to look at specific biomarkers that can be used as a target of treatment. And um, 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 we used two multiplex assays, and this multiplex assays allowed us to quantitate um, about 60 uh, uh, cytokines, chemokines, and, chem and cytokine receptors. And it was very interesting to note that one chemokine, CXCL13, which is a B-cell chemoattractant, was a biomarker for VKH, which means that the B lymphocytes are involved in the autoimmune process of VKH. And uh, this um, graph will tell you, this is CXCL13, this is VKH, the levels in VKH were significantly highest, compared, of course, it is present at very low levels in the control, less levels in Bechet disease, less levels in HLB27, nephritis, and less levels than sarcoidosis. So we realize that this uh, CXCL13 or the B-cell chemoattractant is a specific biomarker for VKH. What does this mean? It means that B lymphocytes are predominantly involved in VKH. In addition, we showed that in the same study that the cytokines, the twig, April and buff are elevated in the equus humor from patients with VKH disease. And these three cytokines, they promote B-cell survival, differentiation, proliferation, and maturation, immunoglobulin class switching, and antibody production. In addition, in a previous study uh, of sympathetic of Selmia, as Russell mentioned, sympathetic of Selmia is very close to that of VKH. This is the croid histopathology. And um, if you look here, standing for B-cells, anti-CD20, standing for T-cells, you can see more B lymphocytes in the croid. So these two studies allowed us to, to think that B lymphocytes are involved in VKH and perhaps depleting B lymphocytes using B cell depleting agents such as rituximab might be effective in patients with refractory chronic recurrent um, uh, uveitis associated with VKH disease. And we published the first study in which we looked at, we, we demonstrated the efficacy of B-cell depletion therapy with rituximab in refractory chronic recurrent UVI associated with Vokranagrada disease. And you can see this is a patient before rituximab use. With these patients, we tried everything, but without any response. And this patient after rituximab treatment um, showed marked improvement of the anterior segment inflammation. And of course, you can see uh, the uh, sunset below fundus of this patient. This is another patient. Again, the patient uh, had very refractory um, chronic recurrent uh, granulomatous um, uveitis, anterior uveitis associated with VKH disease. And after rotoximab therapy, we, uh, there was complete control of the inflammation that allowed us to do cataract surgery of this patient. And this is her fundus after. Um, uh, uh, after cataract surgery. This is another case of refractory granulomatous uveitis with VKH and after rituximab therapy. I think by this I can conclude my presentation and thank you, thank you very much for your attention. So thank you, uh, Dr. Ahmed. That was really wonderful and especially your uh, telling us about the microperimetry and uh, laser speckle flowgraphy for uh, VKH. So thank you very much. So with this, uh, we uh, and many of the questions in the QA section have been answered by your talk. So you've answered many of these questions. Thank you very much. So we now uh, move on to the next talk. This is the recorded talk we have from Dr. Annabella um, Okada on the management of VKH. So can we have the uh, team to put on the talk? Hello, this is Annabelle Okada from the Kyoto University School of Medicine in Tokyo, Japan. I'd like to thank the organizers for allowing me to share my thoughts on the management of BKH disease with you. These are my disclosures, uh, none of uh, which are pertinent to what I will be saying here today. For those of you who do not know, uh, BKH disease is extremely common in Japan 
and of new uveitis diagnoses uh, in 2016, it was number two after sarcoidosis, comprising 8.1% of new patient referrals. My management of BKH disease relies heavily on OCT technology, both uh, spectral domain and swept source OCT. So I do use spectral domain OCT uh, in the enhanced depth imaging mode, the EDI OCT, uh, to evaluate and follow my patients with acute VKH disease as they undergo treatment. Here are two patients that I uh, have uh, here uh, as an example. At presentation, there are serous retinal detachments, but I look at the choroid because I want to know how thick it is. And at presentation, it's off uh, the image uh, so you cannot uh, actually see where the border of the choroid and the sclera is. But after about one week of treatment, and I start patients on intravenous pulse uh, corticosteroids uh, followed by oral steroids, you can see here that the border between the choroid and the sclera is now visible. The serous retinal detachments are going down. The best corrected visual acuities, which are written in here, are getting better. And you can follow the choroidal thickness over treatment. It's now getting into close to normal range in the 300 micron uh, level on, in patient uh, one on the left side and in patient two on the right side, it's uh, in the 200s. And then at 12 months of treatment. And you can see here uh, that the cord is pretty much normal. The serous retinal detachments, of course, have been gone for a long time. So we've written up uh, these so now what happens when posterior inflammation recurs in VKH disease? Well, this is a patient who had been successfully treated and was off corticosteroids, was off all systemic treatment, but then had a recurrence. So this is before the recurrence. And the patient had normal thickness for Japanese, uh, that is. And there's a, a, some sunset glow fundus, but you don't see, uh, for example, atrophy around the disc in this patient. Uh, and there were no anterior chamber cells or vitreous cells. The patient was pretty much uh, considered uh, to be successfully treated. But then, and I just want you to remember th these uh, cordial thickness uh, says for this patient. When the patient had a recurrence, you can see here that the cordial thickness was about double. And this patient recurred, but did not have any symptoms at all. So there are no anterior chamber cells, no vitreous cells. Uh, there was no serous retinal detachment, but you can see here that since we follow our patients at every patient visit with EDI OCT, we knew this patient had recurred uh, and in both eyes. So this patient was put back on oracle steroids combined with uh, an immunosuppressive agent, which in Japan, we need to use cyclosporin. That's the only one available to us using the Japanese national health insurance system. And then tapered off the steroids first, uh, tapered cyclosporin much more slowly over years. And the patient, of course, did well with preserved good visual acuity, 1.2 in each eye. This is the clinical course of that patient thereafter. And you can see here that the cord is now thinner than the previous baseline. And we've found that uh, patients who do have posterior recurrences of choroiditis end up with more atrophy later on uh, with treatment. So now uh, I do do indocyanine green angiogra angiography in addition to fluorescein angiography, especially uh, at presentation, more as a confirmatory uh, measure. I can diagnose a VKH disease without angiography, but I am at a research institution, so we do collect data. And you can see here, this is a typical patient at presentation with uh, pinpoint leakage at the RP level in the posterior pole with pooling and late images where the serous retinal detachments are. And in the par far periphery, you can see nonspecific leakage of fluorescein from the retinal vasculature near the ciliary bodies where there's a lot of disease. So this is typical. You do not see, however, retinal vasculitis signs in the posterior pole. And I just want to emphasize that because if you do, you should often think of a, a different disease uh, than VKH disease. 
So this is the Indocinian green angiography picture, and you can see here that there are multiple dark dots uh, spread mostly in the posterior pole, but also uh, spread out towards the, especially the uh, mid periphery. And this is quite typical of acute VKH disease. And as again, I, I use this really more for confirmation uh, and for research purposes. So this is a typical patient that I would see in Japan who has prodromal symptoms, and we all know those consist of headache and, and flu-like symptoms. The headache can be sometimes extremely uh, prominent, and some patients actually go to a neurologist to get evaluated first and get, end up getting head uh, CTs and MRIs done. And then comes the posterior pulse serous retinal detachment, which would lead to visual acuity loss or visual disturbance prompting presentation to usually a local ophthalmologist first who in Japan knows to suspect VKH disease right away and send it to the university teaching hospital where we see the patient as specialists. And at that point, they still may not have any anterior cells at all. So we are able to start them on therapy, which uh, I would admit patients to the hospital and put them on intravenous uh, uh, pulse doses of methylprednisolone, and I will go, that, uh, will go through that in my next few slides. And they do very well, and they may have some sunset glow funds, but that's about it. Uh, and it ends up being a monophasic disease in Japan in approximately 80% of our cases. So how do I treat acute VKH disease? Well, as I had just mentioned, I use Pulse doses of IV methylprednisolone, 1,000 milligrams per day for three days. And I follow that with oral prednisolone at a dose of 0 0.8 to 1 milligram per kilogram per day for roughly a week. And then I evaluate them using both EDIOCT, which you can do pretty much every few days whenever you want to, the patient's in the house. And I repeat the fluorescein angiogram in about five to seven days after the last uh, day of intravenous corticosteroids. And then uh, if the patient has a much thinner choroid, almost no serous retinal detachment, and does not have much disc fluorescein leakage, disc hyperfluorescence on the fluorescein angiogram, I consider those patients have a good response, and I would just taper them off their oral steroids uh, quicker initially, and then with a sort of a slower taper at the end, a long tail, for over about 12 months. Some of these patients are on some eye drops for anterior chamber cells, and I, of course, would taper that as well. Now, if I think the patient has an inadequate response, I would consider repeating the pulse dose. Most patients get one or two pulses. I've gone up to three pulses in a few patients. So now, what happens, though, when patients don't come right away to the specialist? And this happens in Japan, too. So usually those patients often have anterior chamber cells already. Some have posterior synechia, some have shallow chamber. Some patients uh, have not, uh, you, you can't see the fundus because you can't dilate them due to posterior synechia and you have to end up evaluating them with other means such as ultrasonography. They may have vitreous cells, cystoid macular edema. So by the time you start therapy, they have more inflammation and they need longer overall systemic treatment which will involve uh, inevitably uh, IMT or immunomodulatory therapy using uh, uh, either immunosuppressive agents uh, and or biologic agents. And they would get more sunset glow fundus, they would get more uh, cataract and glaucoma complications of uveitis in general, but especially VKH disease. And so this is how I would treat patients with delayed presentation, or I have in parentheses here, inadequate initial treatment, which can happen sometimes. Um, so again, I start them with pulse doses of uh, steroids. They still have serous retinal detachment. They still have visual loss. They need to be hit hard and fast with something that's going to really suppress the inflammatory pulse process. And then I put them on orals, and I repeat this if necessary, depending on how the EDIOCT looks, how the fluorescein angiogram looks. But these patients need longer overall treatment. And so you cannot keep them on steroids, obviously, uh, for very long. So I 
uh, add on after tapering steroids down to about 30 milligrams per day I add on are uh, only immunosuppressive that is uh, available using the Japanese health insurance system which is cyclosporin and I usually add it on at about two to three milligrams per kilogram per day uh, sometimes if patients have renal problems and uh, that limits obviously your use of this uh, immunosuppressive agent that has toxic effects to the kidneys then I would use adalimumab which is also approved under the Japanese health insurance system but no other biologics are so it's, a, it's either humor or nothing else so uh, these patients end up getting their steroids tapered first and then their IMT whether it's cyclosporin or uh, adalimumab uh, continued but tapered uh, for cyclosporin, tapered off slowly over a few years. Uh, if they require Humira, I, I, I'm not one who is into tapering Humira. Uh, I haven't used it in too many patients. However, this is something that needs to be investigated and in how to stop this drug in a patient with VKH disease. So now why do patients have a delayed presentation to the specialist, which is me or one of you listening in the audience here? Well, there are patient issues. First, as I had previously mentioned, some, some of these prodromal symptoms really are very uh, scary for the patient, especially if they have prominent headache. And patients are often uh, going to a neurologist first and actually getting an MRI or CT scan before they realize that they have visual uh, disturbances. So uh, that's one reason. Uh, often in the elderly, uh, they think it's just an eyeglasses problem. It's, their, their presbyopia is just uh, progressing more. Uh, so I've seen this a lot. Sometimes, the, although the choroidal thickening, the choroiditis is a diffuse choroiditis, uh, sometimes the subretinal fluid accumulation is only around the disc and not in the central macula. So that central vision is preserved in the initial stages and the patient really doesn't have visual symptoms. And that's also another reason for delayed uh, presentation to the ophthalmologist. In Japan, some uveitis specialists referred to this as the DISC type of VKH disease. I do not divide my VKH disease into DISC type and, and the usual type. It's really a diffuse choroiditis. It's just where the subretinal fluid happens to end up uh, accumulating. Now, there are ophthalmology issues, too. The initial ophthalmologist out in the community may not be able to examine the choroid. Uh, doesn't have uh, access to EDI OCT or endocyanine green angiography and thinks that this could actually be bilateral CSC which is very uncommon unless you're you're on oral steroids as a steroid induced CSC or bilateral AMD without uh, hemorrhage uh, so uh, this can lead to delay in presentation I've also had ophthalmologists or even teaching hospital uh, specialists uh, saying that this is all related to renal disease in a patient of mine who was on hemodialysis and uh, that delayed her her treatment it uh, it, it uh, and she had uh, chronic serous retinal detachments uh, for a long time before she ended up in my clinic and the other issue uh, is that if it's in the very acute state there there are no anterior cells uh, still and sometimes uh, that also leads to more of a misdiagnosis thinking that this is just CSC now what about chronic recurrent VKH disease now I do get a few patients with this but this is something that I believe is uh, a presentation to retina specialists and and UVI specialists more in areas of the world where VKH disease is not as common and that means the United States and probably parts of Europe so uh, what would I do well these patients first of all are past the serous retinal detachment stage they may have varying degrees of sunset glow fundus already and oftentimes already have the late uh, skin manifestations of uh, vitiligo polyosis and alopecia now what I would do is determine the location and degree of active inflammation is it just in the anterior segment or is it also in the posterior segment and to evaluate the choroid as I just mentioned you really need EDI OCT uh, or swept source or OCT as well as endocyanine green angiography now by fundoscopy you would probably see uh, white dots deep in the choroid 
But please, everyone, do not call VKH disease one of the white dot syndromes. It's really not. Uh, and uh, although it is written up that way in, in uh, a few textbooks. Now, if there is choroidal, choroidal involvement, I would recommend initiating immunomodulatory therapy consisting of an immunosuppressive agent uh, that would fit the patient's uh, systemic profile and or biologic agents if available to you in your insurance, health insurance system. Now, I do often supplement with subtenons triamcinolone injections. And the reason is, is again, you want to reduce the infl inflammatory process early on as much as possible. Uh, and uh, if the patient doesn't have uh, much cataract uh, yet and doesn't have an issue with glaucoma, uh, sometimes I like to kickstart the process by uh, giving subtenons injections of steroids. Now, for inflammation in the anterior segment only, uh, you may treat locally with corticosteroid drops and midriatic drops to prevent uh, posterior synechia. You can uh, supplement that with subconjunctival injections of steroids as well. And if you need to deal with the secondary complications of cataract and glaucoma, of course, surgical intervention is common and may be successfully performed under IMT coverage, no problem at all. And should you have a patient who ends up with a secondary C and B cordial neovascularization, of course, anti-VEGF uh, treatment is warranted. Now, Dr. Nakayama, who is an assistant professor uh, working with me, uh, put together our series of 111 patients with new onset acute VKH disease, which we published in the BJO in 2019. And I just want to highlight some of the findings. So as I had mentioned, most patients uh, do fine with either one to two pulses. We did use three pulses in a few patients, followed by oral prednisolone tapered over 12 to 18 months. We did resort to some IMT treatment. As I mentioned, only cyclosporin is available to us under the health insurance system in Japan. And this was used for both steroid sparing uh, as well as uh, recurrent posterior inflammation. So it was used only in 15.3% of patients. Our recurrence rate was overall 22.5%. However, among these patients, anterior segment inflammation only was seen in about 10%. So that meant these patients were treated just with eye drops. Now I did have, we did have posterior inflammation recurrence in 12.6% of patients and the, the, this was managed with uh, increase in the corticosteroids and transitioning to cyclosporin or more recently at alivumab. So that's for new onset acute VH. And our visual acuity outcomes were ex excellent. Some of these patients had to undergo cataract surgery, of course. And these are the disease-related late manifestations. Diffuse fundus glow, sunset glow fundus in about 50% of patients. Peripapular atrophy in about a quarter uh, granular pigment in the foveal area in 10%, which was asymptomatic, and these patients all had excellent visual acuity of 1.2. Peripheral core retinal atrophic spots, uh, sometimes also called numular uh, atrophic lesions uh, in the inferior periphery uh, normally in about 5.5% 5 .5 of patients. And then no cases of subretinal fibrosis or corneal neovascularization. And in terms of systemic late manifestations, a little bit of poliosis in about 9% of patients, although uh, I have to tell you that in Japan, our, uh, our uh, population is a little bit more elderly. I was trying to uh, put the percentage of uh, patients over the age of 60. I'm sorry, I didn't have time to look into that. So in comparison to other large VKH disease studies, well, we all know that uh, Dr. Russell Reed uh, was the lead author on a 48 patient, uh, nine center, five country retrospective study, which Kjordin actually participated in, that concluded that there was no difference in outcomes between oral versus intravenous routes of corticosteroid administration. And this was uh, uh, something that uh, I believe uh, at the time uh, was really the only data out there. Uh, and then uh, Russell put together uh, the patients at uh, Narsing Rouse uh, Center in uh, USC. And 
I believe a lot of these patients were chronic uh, recurrent VKH patients, but he had a high incidence of cataract glaucoma, CNV, and subretinal fibrosis. Uh, so we didn't see those. Now, uh, my good friend Fernando Aravalo uh, put together a big series in Saudi Arabia, and 101 of these patients had acute VKH disease treated with oral steroids. And their overall recurrence rate was 37.6%. And you can see here that they had also high complication rates. Uh, in contrast, in our hands, we have a lower recurrence rate, and we do treat with uh, pulse intravenous steroids. Now, perhaps we see even more uh, faster, earlier acute patients than uh, Fernando did in Saudi Arabia. Uh, so it's hard to compare these papers, but certainly in our hands, we feel that uh, our acute patients who are treated uh, with extremely high doses of corticosteroids early on do very well. So Professor uh, Hiroshi Kano in my department who works with me on uh, uveitis uh, put together this data and published it in Dublin and uh, presented it in Dublin in 2016. He looked at corridor thickness in 36 acute uh, VKH patients and uh, took the mean uh, and followed them over four years. And you can see here that uh, with time, uh, the corridor thickness uh, becomes statistically significantly thinner. And uh, what he did was he uh, took uh, patients, uh, he divided the patients up into two groups, uh, those with Cortical thickness at one week less than 500 microns versus uh, those with uh, cortical thickness uh, greater than 500 microns, greater than or equal to 500 microns at that point, and compared the two groups. And you can see here that over time, the patients who had greater cortical thickness early on at the one week mark ended up with thinner choroids later on, four years later. And as I had mentioned, patients who have recurrences get thinner or atrophic choroid over time. And also patients who have greater thickness or greater choroiditis at the initial uh, presentation have thinner choroids or more atrophy of the choroid later on. So more inflammation does lead to more atrophy later on. However, both groups did well in terms of visual acuity, although there was a little bit of a statistically significant difference. Uh, and it may be that the patients with thicker cords had to undergo uh, more cataract surgery to achieve that final good visual acuity. However, at presentation, you can see here that the eyes with thicker cords, of course, ended up having more anterior segment inflammation initially. And that makes sense because these patients who have thicker cords had been having a little bit longer inflammation at the time they see you. So these are all very acute patients. However, by the time we see the patient at our university, if they've had slightly longer inflammation, they usually have thicker cords and more anterior segment inflammation. So now there are a few special situations uh, that you may have to tailor your treatment. You may not be able to use the same treatment that I had just uh, outlined. And these would be perhaps poorly controlled diabetic patients, patients with poorly controlled hypertension, patients with psychiatric disease or osteoporosis, or extremely elderly patients. However, we uh, do uh, treat even poorly controlled diabetics uh, using the same uh, treatment uh, with using sliding scale insulin. Um, however, this is something that perhaps uh, is someone, a situation where you would not want to use at least systemic corticosteroids and, and start uh, straight away with uh, IMT. Now, you can consider initiating treatment with bilateral subtenons injections. Uh, and that is what I would recommend if the eye can tolerate it. Uh, and particularly in diabetics and the elderly, however, you need to consider the risk uh, to renal function for cyclosporine, which is what we use. And uh, in areas of the world where you have uh, access, uh, health insurance access to other immunosuppressives, uh, maybe this uh, is not an issue, but all immunosuppressives have, of course, side effects. Um, and then there's the special situation of COVID-19 vaccination related VKH disease. I don't want to go into too much detail here, but you can read about this in our Grafies paper. And these patients uh, all did well. Uh, there are other types of uveitis obviously that can occur with 
vaccination. So the take home message of my talk is that the management of VKH disease depends on the stage at which the, the patient is presenting to you, whether acute or delayed or in the chronic current. Acute presentations may be managed by corticosteroid monotherapy. It's a monophasic disease if you really hit them hard and early, so pulse doses uh, with tapering over 12 to 18 months. No recurrence is in roughly 80% in our hands. Now for delayed presentations and chronic recurrent presentations, uh, or the patient has systemic issues, uh, then you usually need to use IMT to ensure a longer treatment period lasting off in several years without much corticosteroid use, obviously. And then treatment efficacy and tapering are easily monitored by following corridor thickness by EDI, OCT, or subsource OCT. And then finally, posterior segment recurrences manifest as corridor rethickening over the most recent baseline. And you can see white dots in the fundus at the level of the choroid. Um, you can see dark dots by indocyte and green angiography. And these patients usually require longer treatment, so that means transitioning to IMT or increasing the regimen. And finally, I would like to dedicate my talk to dear uh, friend Manfred Zierhut, you can see here on the left, and also my good friend Massimo Corinti, who is also part of this uh, webinar. And you can see us with my colleague, uh, Dr. Takaya Watanabe, in front of Mount Fuji back in 2014 uh, when they were all visiting the World Ophthalmology Congress held in Tokyo, Japan. Thank you everyone for listening and I apologize for not being able to participate in the discussion at the end of the webinar. So thank you, Dr. Rokada. That was wonderful sending your talk. And with this, we now move on to the um, last um, topic of this webinar. And if time permits, we'll uh, take up the uh, some of the questions at the end. So we now have Dr. Mamta Agarwal who will be talking on local versus systemic therapy in VKH. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, am I audible? Yes, Mamta. Slide. Yeah. Sorry. Am I audible? Yes, Mamta. All good. Yeah. Um, so uh, that was wonderful uh, hearing the talk by doc, uh, Dr. Okada about the treatment part. So I'll just go through uh, some of the points uh, which I thought uh, would be important considering local and systemic therapy in VKH disease. So as we've all learned that it's a T-cell mediated disease which targets melanocytes and uh, it's a bilateral disease with ocular and extraocular manifestations and treatment can be both systemic or local. It has to be optimal treatment because then we can prevent the complications like cataract, glaucoma, subretinal fibrosis and choroidal neovascularization. I start with my uh, two cases where this was a 25 year old patient who presented with distortion of straight lines in both eyes for the last three weeks. And this was followed by decreased vision, pain, and redness. And she also had headache, loss of hearing, and tinnitus. She was diagnosed by her local ophthalmologist to have disc edema and subretinal fluid, and OCT, which was showing increased choroidal thickness. But unfortunately, she was started only on topical prednisolone. And this is what she presented to our emergency clinic with a red eye, pan uveitis, an ultrasound, uh, ultrasound showed retina attached, but intense vitreous echoes. And this, she was started with topical steroids and intravenous methyl prednisolone, followed by oral steroid and mycophenolate morphetil. And this is another patient, a 16-year-old child who was actually a disease uh, VKH for the last nine years under our care, but suddenly comes to us and he was lost to follow up for two years. And now he presented with granulomatous bilateral uveitis with a sunset glow fundus and peripapillary atrophy. And the third case, a 62-year-old female known case of VKH for 16 years. When I looked at the old records, we had treated her years back with intravenous methylprednisolone and steroids, but she was again lost to follow up. Now she comes for cataract surgery, unaware that the disease was still active. And here she had vitiligo patches and she was not on any treatment. We can see the OCT with RPE folds and undulations. So systemic corticosteroid, as we have learned, is still the cornerstone for the treatment of EKH disease. And the dose, what has been said, that it is 80 to 100 per day 
and at least for two to four weeks. The high dose intravenous and oral, oral steroids have been recommended and early treatment to prevent recurrences and decrease in the loss of pigmentation. And we've seen this study by Kitai et al. that as high as 200 milligram per day within 13 days of onset, it required a shorter duration of steroid dose with an equal final visual acuity. How about dose of corticosteroid? This study, they had made three groups. And group A, the treatment was started at one mg per kg per day with immunosuppressive therapy within two weeks of the disease. And the authors conclude that higher doses, they decrease the duration of the disease. Whereas in group B and group C, low doses had more peripapillary atrophy and more recurrences. Similar study by Kawaguchi et al. They also said higher doses decrease the incidence of sunset fundus. And how about the route of administration? This is by a uh, group from US and Dr. Reed. And they found that probably intravenous and oral steroids does not make a difference. And route of administration does not affect the change in visual acuity, complications, and the need for use of immunosuppressive therapy. The duration, the authors, these studies, they claim that if we treat them for more than six months, it decreases further ocular symptoms, decreases the recurrences, and improves final visual acuity. So this was one of our patient, as we see bilateral exudative detachment, OCT confirms the same. She was treated with intravenous methyl, prednisolone, steroids, and azathioprine, but then lost to follow up. What we see here is a sunset glow fundus with RP migration as the patient was on sub-therapeutic dose for longer times. And this is the child I mentioned earlier, again, sunset glow fundus and peripetally atrophy because sub-therapeutic dose for longer times. Besides steroids, what we all know, VKH is an absolute indication now for immunomodulatory therapy because of the long-term steroid complications and recurrent nature of the disease. And the various drugs that are in place now, we know that cyclosporin A, cyclophosphamide, azathioprine, chlorambucil, which we, we in our practice do not use, and most commonly mycophenolate morphetil. So this is a recent study published in Retina, which the authors, they analyzed that what we combine systemic corticosteroids and early immunomodulatory therapy within three months of onset of VKH disease. And they found that visual acuity and subfoveal choroidal thickness decreased in both the groups. However, chronic and recurrent VKH disease was much less in the group two, where we had started immunomodulatory therapy. And also the incidence of sunset glow fundus was far less than group A. Another study from Singapore, they also confirmed that eyes with immunosuppressive therapy, which was started within six weeks, had better visual outcome at four years, but the similar occurrence of sunset glow fundus and uveitis. And this is by uh, Dr. Ahmed, their study. I also reiterate that if we start mycophenolate morphetil with systemic steroids, it does prevent the progression of chronic recurrent inflammation and development of sunset glow fundus. And their results were visual acuity improved in more than 93% eyes, steroid sparing effect in all, 57% discontinued treatment, and none of the eyes progressed to chronic recurrent disease. And these are two, uh, two patients which he also shared today, where we see that there was no recurrence at 36 months and 54 months, and there was no sunset glow fundus. Besides immunomodulatory therapy, biologics are another group which we all know used in refractory VKH, the disease where it is chronic and recurrent. Patients who have poor response to corticosteroids and immunomodulatory drugs and who are resistant and intolerant to conventional therapy. There have been case reports and series on adalimumab, rituximab, and infliximab. And the therapeutic effect, they say, it is often seen after one to two infusions. Oral steroids can be tapered off in minimum four weeks. This is a recent study from Switzerland Group. And they found that if they use adalimumab in refractory VKH patients, the induction dose 80 milligrams, followed by 40 milligrams at one week, and then alternate week, they were able to reduce steroids from 20 milligrams to two milligrams. And this is another study which is recently published. And they also found the same, that the sunset low fundus in 70 patients was seen in 71%, but they found that it was the disease was well controlled and adalimumab was continued in 91% patients. And these graphs, they, they say that with the drugs, biologics, they could reduce the flare count, subfoveal choroidal thickness, and ICGA from baseline and six months. 
And similarly, the dose of steroids and immunosuppressives could be reduced. Besides systemic treatment, local treatment we all know consists of corticosteroids, cycloplegics and midriatics, and antivagives in patients who develop complications like uh, choroidal neovascular membrane and macular edema. So we know that the subtenone injection in pregnant patients with VKH disease has been published from the Japanese group. Another study, they found intravitreal triamcinolone acetonide for the rebound phenomena after high-dose intravenous steroid treatment in a patient with VKH disease. And this is a case report from AJO and where the patients have treated these two patients. The, the doctors have treated two patients with intravitreal triamcinolone in a patient with serous RD. And we can see the resolution of subretinal fluid at one month in both eyes. So besides the intravitreal injection, there have been reports of dexamethasone intravitreal implant in a patient with VKH disease. As we see here, it's a chronic macular edema, which has resolved post ozodex implant. And this is a recent study, which is published in IGO. And the authors, they studied 16 patients. And the inclusion criteria was relapsing posterior uveitis in chronic VKH disease with subretinal fluid and retinal detachment. Patients were already treated with corticosteroids and immunomodulatory therapy, and they treated them with dexamethasone implant. 21 eyes had one injection and eight eyes received two injections. Visual acuity improved and central foveal thickness reduced. Only three eyes developed ocular hypertension and 11 eyes had cataract. And this is a study by Proctor Group. These are the case reports and they had implanted a reticert implant in this patient. And two months later, there was a recurrence and then intravitreal triamcinolone was given. So local therapy, as we see, intravitreal triamcinolone and flucinolone implant, it improves visual acuity, macular edema, and serous retinal detachment. Same way, IVTA has a shorter duration, needs repeat injections, has a greater risk of endothelmitis, and more propensity for cataract and glaucoma. It's similar with reticert and illuvium. But dexamethasone implant, it's a biodegradable implant, which needs less injections. So these are one, a few cases where I can say that this was a chronic VKH, patient had macular edema, and it was a combined therapy, both local and systemic therapy. And this is resolution at 10 months, visual acuity improves. This is another patient who developed choroidal neovascular membrane with cystic spaces. And besides the systemic treatment, patient was treated with intravitreal antivagus. And here there's improvement in vision and CNVM scarred. And this is another one with extrafoveal active CNVM with cystic spaces. And again, it's a combined treatment with steroids, immunosuppression, and antivagus injections. So in conclusion, I would say that VKH being a multi-organ inflammatory disease, the treatment is an enigma. Acute VKH, we can treat with IVMP, oral steroids, and immunosuppressives, but a chronic, recurrent, relapsing, and resistant VKH needs treatment both systemically and locally. And local treatment is just an adjuvant which shortens the duration and dose of systemic treatment, especially in patients who are intolerant to systemic treatment and non-compliant and systemic complications. But her local treatment just alone is definitely not recommended. Thank you so much for patient hearing. Thank you, Mamta. So with this, with this, we now come to the end uh, of the webinar for the with the talks, and we now have I think ten minutes left. Yeah, we will so, take up some questions. Yeah, questions and over to the panelists for any points that you would like to discuss. Thank uh, you, Rita. Thank you. I think this is the time to discuss the controversies and. One controversy which we have seen emerging in the talks is the timing of initiating immunosuppression. So we did hear two talks is by to who has been saying that you add immunosuppression on day one, sunset glow recurrence is much low, and then we heard Annabelle talking about monotherapy with steroids for a very long term basis, but then she also showed almost 49% patients in their series developing sunset glow. Now, we are a global community, so I would like to start with Dr. Yang to begin with. Uh, yes, we are, we, we are getting the entire perspective from everyone. 
So we can begin with Ahmad. What is your take on the timing of immunosuppressive therapy? Thank you, Vishali. Um, uh, in the past, when we were using only systemic corticosteroids, uh, most of the patients developed sensory growth fundus. And we were thinking that sensory growth fundus is a part of the normal evolution of the disease. Nobody realized that sensory growth fundus is due to inadequate control of inflammation at the level of the coit. Then um, uh, I still remember that I had a, a heavy discussion with uh, my colleague and friend, uh, Carl Herbert. And uh, we were in a train, we were in a meeting in Tokyo. And um, I told him, Carl, when I go back to Riyadh, I shall add immunomodulatory agent as the first line treatment, in addition to steroids. And since that time, I was using mycophenolate mofetil usually in this patient. Now, as you know, mycophenolate mofetil and all other immunomodulatory agents, they need time to act, at least eight to 10 weeks. So if you delay their initiation, and uh, as uh, this paper from Singapore, in fact, uh, this paper from by Dr. Chi from Singapore, they acknowledge in the discussion that they needed to, to start immunomodulatory agents as a first line treatment at presentation rather than to start it within three months. Because these drugs they need, they are slowly acting, they need time to act. So by combining steroids plus mycophenolate mofetil, then we use the high dose steroids for at least the two months. And then once we know that mycophenolate mofetil is effective, then we can taper the steroid to safe level. In our, in our patients, the mean duration from starting steroid to tapering to 10 milligram or less is about four months. Thank you. And, 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 and the mycophenolate mofetil will take over. And all the patients that presented early without anti signet inflammation, none of them developed uh, sunset glow fundus, none of them progressed into chronic recurrent evolution. Thank you. Now, Russell, you have studied different populations while you were at Tohini. Uh, and there is a question which Rima is typing answer right now. Do you think the immunomodulatory choice would depend on your ethnicity? Or would, you, would it vary from region to region? I do understand all of us have different practices. Like Annabella was talking about cyclosporin, which frankly, we never use for VKH, uh, but would your choice be driven by uh, the ethnicity? No, um, my choice is based on the comorbidities typically of the patient. And then more recently, over the last couple of years, it's been based on um, Nishi Acharya's FAST trial, which you know suggested that posterior uveitic um, diseases might respond better to methotrexate. So I've been using methotrexate more and more in diseases like VKH and birdshot and, and things like that based on that trial. But with the usual caveats, if there's a patient for which methotrexate is not the best choice, they have you know, pre-existing liver disease, they may you know, have alcohol consumption that makes you concerned, then my, uh, mycophenolate, azathioprine are certainly reasonable. Like you, I haven't used cyclosporin in quite a while, and Annabelle and uh, other practitioners in Japan, it's, it's basically it's out of their hands. Their national health service requires the use of that. But I think, I mean, going back to the original question, you know, the key issue to me is, is you're trying to avoid sunset glow fundus because we do have evidence that patients developing sunset glow fundus have you know, worse visual outcomes, not just from acuity, but contrast sensitivity and other features. So what's what causes sunset glow fundus? It's, as has been said, ongoing inflammation. So the key is whatever therapy it takes to prevent ongoing inflammation. And I think as uh, a Matt's talk, it showed very well, you know, with our evolution of imaging modalities, we're much better able to follow sort of subclinical silent inflammation, whether it's through continued enhanced depth OCT or whether it's ICG or now some of the newer imaging. So I don't automatically put people on immunosuppression 
at the beginning, if the initial course of steroids shows me that I've completely controlled inflammation, I think we have pretty good methods of determining that. But if during the taper of the steroids, it looks like there's recurrence, well, then like with any other uveitic entity, that's when I'm going to put them back on a slightly higher dose and institute immunosuppression. So that's generally my approach to any form of uveitis. Uh, thank you, Russ. Dr. Yang, uh, I have a question for you. You are studying a lot of pathogenesis. Has it changed the treatment protocol for your patients depending mm -hmm. on your work on pathogenesis? You are muted, Dr. Yang. Can we unmute you? Massimo, we come to oh, you. Thank you. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you very much for your question. So really, the basic research is beneficial for our clinic study. But uh, anyway, there are maybe the different uh, different way, but we uh, study the pathogenic mechanism of VKH disease and uh, show that the TH17, this, this evening we don't talk about the TH1 cell. And uh, I think uh, the immunosuppressive agent and uh, and uh, anti tnf alpha uh, they exert their effects through incubation TH1 and TH17 cell. So I think in future, if we can find some target molecule, we can develop um, development, we can develop the therapy stage against the, the molecule. So I think it's uh, very useful for the uh, uh, clinical study in future. So thank you. Thank you. Yes, Massimo. Okay, just coming back to the therapy, I think the very important key point is the time you examine the patient for the first time and the time you start the therapy. Because uh, uh, we have had brilliant results from uh, Hamed and all the others who use immunosuppressive since the beginning. But, but if you need immunosuppressive, maybe you have to move to biologic first because they act faster than conventional therapies such as methotrexate or mycophenolate. So we should uh, think that, uh, at least in my experience, I'm only, treat, uh, I'm only speaking about Caucasian patients. There might be some patient that can respond uh, initially uh, totally to corticosteroid. Although many of the patients I've treated during this year have come to my attention very late during the course of the disease. In my opinion, uh, the Sansa glofundus, and this is the statistical evidence of my series, that Sansa glofundus is strongly related to more complication and to a worse visual acuity at the end of the follow-up. So we have to prevent anyway. If we see the, the paper from Carl Ebert Hamed, also in China, they have had 25% of patients developing Sansa glofundus without the chronic disease. So we, if we can have the chance to treat the patients initially, we have to offer them steroids and immunosuppressive. On the other hand, uh, in my experience, uh, I've also treated patients very late with immunosuppressive and the overall prognosis is better in these patients compared to those who have been uh, not treated with immunosuppressive. And the very important things to know is that we have to treat initially with intravenous steroids, not oral, at least in the experience of the Caucasian patients. Thank you. Thank you. Mamta. From your institute, there has been recent report of treating recalcitrate VKH with JAK inhibitors. JAK inhibitors. It's a controversial area, kind of, because on the one hand, we are reporting VKH-like disease due to JAK inhibitors, and then JAK inhibitors being used as an alternative to rituximab in recalcitrant disease. Any thoughts on this? 
I actually not even I, I I agree with the same. It's very much like interferon. Interferon has been used for VKH, but may also induce VKH. But it's like it's refractory uh, patient of acetonib jack inhibitor was the it's a cheaper drug patients could afford and it's like last resort of the thing that okay we can do knowing the ifs and buts of the treatment but obviously it is it cannot be the treatment like if it doesn't respond then we have to go to jack inhibitors probably it's just one of the case which they've reported but in my experience i think what i i gather from the literature intravenous methylprednisolone oral steroids and immunosuppression at the first go because we being a tertiary care, we actually see more of complicated cases than the first presentation. So most of the time they can come with a, a exudative detachment, which is longstanding and has been misdiagnosed as CSR, or it has been with complications with neovascularization. So in my experience that we start immunosuppression, most commonly we do with azathioprine just because of the cost factor. But otherwise azathioprine and mycophenolate with steroids goes a long way. And steroids, we don't really continue till six months or so. We usually taper it by three to four months till the time it kicks in the immunosuppressive therapy. And we don't have really good experience with uh, intravitreal implants in the acute stages, or I think that is not necessary at that point because patients do respond. But I see a couple of reports where they've given in the acute stage intravenous intravitreal injections and implants. What is your experience on that? No, I agree. We, we, we do. Ahmad, before you say, there is a question I want you to answer from Hind. Hind says she's seen four patients who had Bechet's disease, but also had sunset glow. Now, is sunset glow, which is so typical of VKH, or can it happen in other poorly treated posterior uveitis as well? You mean other than VKH? There's a question. Uh, Why did budgets? We, well, never saw, we never saw sunset glow fundus, like, for example, in the in the shed disease. You know, well, sunset glow fundus is due to loss of pigments in the croid. And um, it's logic to have it in VKH because it is primarily granulomatous choroiditis. But yeah, uh, the uh, sun yeah. criteria, the sun cr classification criteria, you know, they so that study or that that process looked at the population, used machine learning to come up with the features, and for late VKH, it was sunset glow was the big one, and then it tested that against uh, you know a population that wasn't part of the study, and that was validated. So, based and and part of the population it was tested against included Bechet's patients. So that would suggest that sunset glow is not a part of Bechet's, at least in the you know 1,200 or so patients that were in that population. So maybe this patient uh, had both. I mean, they both could occur in a similar population or some other feature, or it wasn't sunset glow. So we take well, the last two questions beginning with Rima. I was intrigued by Annabella's approach of doing fluorescein at one day. five to seven days of giving IV and repeating IV pulse. Mm -hmm. Like I have never done it. So I want Even, to I haven't done it either. We don't repeat it. Probably at one month or two months, we would repeat if needed. But OCT is the um, diagnostic skill that we use to monitor VKH now. We don't really repeat so early. ICG may be probably in the recurrences and chronic stage where we want to know the intensity of the disease. Not, not at five days. Not because at five days. days. Yes. Sherry, can I give us, um, uh, uh, there was no time that I, uh, to discuss during the imaging lecture, our uh, new findings on the therapeutic window of opportunity. So the, the therapeutic window of opportunity has been studied extensively in rheumatoid arthritis that if you start the treatment very early in the course of the disease, then you can modulate the immune system and uh, you can prevent long-term autoimmune damage. And even you can stop the treatment without having recurrence, inducing long-term remission. So what I would like to say here is that the outcome depends on how the patient present. For those patients who presented to us very early with quite anterior segment, no inflammation in the anterior segment, 
with exudative detachment confined to the posterior retina, very papillary area or to the macular area. None of them developed sensory growth fundus. None of them had chronic recurrent evolution. None of them had any complication. On the other hand, patients who presented late with anterior segment inflammation, with bacillus cyanicia, mutton fat, cratic precipitates, bullous exudative detachment extending to the periphery, these patients, 50%, 60% of them had sensory growth fundus, and 30% progressed into chronic recurrent evolution and needed longer course of treatment. So the, the challenge here that is to diagnose the disease early and be treated early. And that's what I'm trying here in our country because we're still having the challenge that even some of some monologists, some of them are retina consultants, they misdiagnose early cases as central cell scroidopathy. We see patients who are referred by the ophthalmologist to neurology. They do MRI brain, they do lumbar puncture, and at the end, the patient comes to us with a bolus exercise So the, the main challenge here, based on our data, that how should we diagnose the disease early and the, at the stage when the disease is confined to the obscure segment before involving the anterior segment, and to start adequate immunosuppressive therapy. Thank you, Ahmed. I think that sums up the webinar that the main uh, challenge, I wouldn't say the challenge, but it's important to diagnose it at the earliest because the diagnosis is mostly clinical based on the imaging. We don't have labs, but Russell has beautifully put it, like how would you rule out the other possible differentials? And uh, Massimo talked very nicely about the epidemiology. And of course, the race would be a factor when you are making the diagnosis, ruling out others. But don't take too long ruling out the other possibilities. If it's a disease which you think BKH on angiography, clinically, the treatment has to be initiated at the earliest. Immunosuppression, I think everyone agrees, has to be started again, would depend on your country and whatever is available, but it has to be long-term immunosuppression most of the times. Unless there is a subset of patients whom you think would respond to steroids, uh, there is a kind of a diverse view on that. With this, if any panelist wants to give a last minute message, please go ahead and add to it before we conclude. Message for our friends who may not have all the facilities to manage these patients. So any tip from your experience, if you have uh, anyone, before we conclude. I think one uh, one thing I would uh, like to add here is uh, we didn't talk about patients who present with shallow ACs, ciliary body rotation, and acute angle closure who present as an acute angle closure but they are VKH patients. So I think that is a very important clinical finding that not every bilateral acute angle closure can be just a primary angle closure. If there is inflammation, I think VKH stands very high on a differential in these patients. So we've seen a couple of patients where there is PI done both eyes and probably the fundus was not seen, ultrasound was not done. So the clinical diagnosis was missed. So what I find from my practice, I think this is a very important differential in a VKH especially for the general ophthalmologists who treat every angle closure with the peripheral iridotomy. So we, we need to look into that. Well, with this, I would like to thank, yes, Russell, did you, you, you think something? Uh, I'll, I'll make one final comment. I was just gonna say, I think, you know, in these sort of sessions, because we all live and breathe uveitis, we, we tend to slice and dice and sometimes make it overcomplicated. I mean, the basic thing in uveitis, if you don't have the facilities or the mechanisms to, do all these advanced imaging techniques and everything we've talked about. The basic idea for any uveitis is rule out infection. And then if that's ruled out, control inflammation by whatever means you have at your disposal, steroids, immunosuppression. So whether it's Bechette's or VKH, you're still going to treat the inflammation and then follow it. So it's, it's not as complicated as sometimes it seems. I totally agree. That's what, if the phenotype is typical, it's non-infectious, just treat it. I totally agree. And with this, I would like to thank Reema, 
for moderating and all the panelists for taking time out of your busy schedules to be with us on Friday, irrespective of your time zones. And we see you again next uh, month. It's about skin and gymnitis. Thank you very much once again, everyone, and a very happy new. Thank you. Thank you, Vishali. Thank you, Vishali. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. And bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Done.